Even if you take all appropriate steps to protect your safety, there's always a chance that sometime, somewhere, in the course of your duties as a United States probation or pretrial services officer, you may become the victim of a crime. Or you may experience a critical incident, an incident that doesn't technically make you a crime victim, but affects you in much the same manner. One of the secretaries came uh, towards my office and stated in an excited fashion that um, there was an individual um, by the entrance of the fifth floor that was on the floor that was apparently um, going through a seizure. So I, uh, I went over um, to investigate to see what was going on. She exploded uh, after I told her that she had to uh, report to my office the following day so that we can make these arrangements. She totally lost it. She had a file in her hand. She stood up abruptly, she, which startled me. And when she stood up, she flung the file, and all the contents of the file just flew in the other direction. And she just began to rant and rave, and I'm tired of this. Who do you think you are? A Saturday night, about uh, approximately two weeks after the Russell shooting, my wife answered the phone at around 9, 9.30. She called down to where I was in the house that uh, someone was for me on the extension. When I answered, a male voice indicated, uh, well, first of all, he verified who I was. He said, are you Ronald L. Smith, the U.S. probation officer? And I said, yes. And he said, how are you? And I said, fine. And he said, well, you're not going to be. And I said, pardon me? And he said, you're going to die. And I wasn't sure I heard correctly, and I said, what'd you say, or pardon me? And he said, I'm going to kill you. As I was going from the government car to my car, I was approached by three black males, one brandishing a firearm, uh, who instructed me to turn away from them. Uh, upon reaching me, he grabbed me, he turned me around, being very careful, standing directly behind me so I couldn't see him. At that particular point, I... Um, went to my knees and, and, and uh, tried to make the individual as comfortable as possible by removing his jacket and loosening his tie and bu unbuttoning his shirt and just kind of hold on, holding on to him so that he didn't further injure himself from his constant moving. Um, his body was shaking uh, incredibly. Um, his head was, was, um, was banging, he's banging his head against the floor. One of our officers was killed. Um by her husband um, when she went to family court uh, to deal with a uh, uh, part of the custody and divorce issues that she was facing. So she left our office and went across the street to family court with the intention of coming back. Um, and he, he killed her while they were waiting for their hearing to come up. He then instructed me to lie down on the ground simultaneously striking me over the head with a, with a handgun. Uh, he then assisted me to the ground by pushing me, at which time he instructed me to spread my legs open and to push my hands out in front of me, at which time they removed, my, uh, they removed one ring, a watch, uh, my badge, and the car keys to the government vehicle. I took the uh, plastic object and, and put it in the indiv individual's mouth and my hand at the time was about a half inch away from his teeth. During this period, he was foaming from the mouth, he was convulsing, um, and um, he started to bleed a short time later. She had a positive urine testing for, um, I thought it was morphine, cocaine and morphine, but it turns out it was uh, cocaine and PCP. And PCP uh, is something that causes people to be um, very incoherent, extremely volatile. And um, it is something that if, if they are under the influence, they, their reasoning is they have none. Two of the assailants went to the vehicle, uh, and they ransacked the vehicle, looking appears as though they were looking for something, what I don't know. Uh, at that time, they, 
They then started the car, and the gunman, who was holding the gun to my head throughout the entire incident, instructed me to crawl on my stomach from the back of the government vehicle towards the rear of my vehicle. Again, the two vehicles was parked al alongside each other. They then backed out of the parking lot. It was a Friday afternoon. It was quiet in the office, and um, the, the, my superiors, the people that are above me, were out um, for the day. And a call came in, and one of the secretaries had taken it, and she said to me, Elaine, I got a call from a detective. Um, it's about Danielle. I think she may have been injured. And I called the detective back, and my first question was, is this about Danielle? Is she okay? And he told me no. And he explained what had happened. Um, and then things just started speeding up. It was so real and vivid and going to happen that I, really, I was concerned that it was going to happen right then, that it was going to be soon. And the first thing that we did was turn on the outside spotlights, uh, you know, pull down curtains, get my weapon, et cetera, to try to get ready because I, it, it appeared that it was going to happen right then. A short time later, I was informed that uh, this individual was uh, HIV positive. So then when I was leaving and I was halfway down the street and she followed me and she uh, said if I attempted to report this, I could not hide in D.C., Maryland, or Virginia. And I, again, squared myself off if she ran at me and her friend followed her. So, And I um, asked her calmly if that were a threat. And she said, no, blank, that's a promise. So I said, thank you very much. And I turned around, and of course, inside I'm like jello, but on the outside, you couldn't tell. I can't. Of course, officers don't like to think of themselves as victims. They're trained professionals, and they like to feel they can handle whatever comes their way. It's, it's not generally in my nature to feel like a victim. Um, I mean, even when there are times when the car stolen and different things, and you are a victim, and I just don't, it's not, not the way that I think to think like that. And I used to keep t saying this myself, oh, no, don't let it get to you, you're, you know. And every time I would do that, I would tell myself, you know, you're letting it get to you. And I would become mad at myself. Well, it's a kind of a 180 degree situation, opposite situation, because as a probation officer, you're more or less in control. And as, an, as a victim, you have no control. And, uh, it's not a nice feeling. So that is even hard in itself to, to be someone that has a certain ounce of pride to have to sit there and, and be um, abused in that way, verbally abused, and almost physically abused in that way and not be able to defend yourself. And even sometimes now I became angry at myself, say, so he had a gun, why didn't you do something, you know? And I've said this to a couple of my friends, I said, you're crazy, you know, those guys had a gun. You know, I said, you know, I, I don't care. I still should have done something. You know, I think what happened is more, it becomes more or less a fight with my, uh, with my uh, attitude as far as, you know, rather than saying, thank God I'm alive, you know, it's like, you know, yeah, I'm alive, but I've lost, you know, my manhood because, you know, I have allowed these guys to just invade me and not do anything, you know what I'm saying? So it becomes like, you know, a fight of like, you know, right of survival versus, you know, rather than being thankful that I'm alive, you know, I'm more upset about, you know, my pride. It's important that you be able to let yourself be a victim, if in fact you are one. That's because when something bad happens to you, it will have effects, whether you want it to or not starting with the strong physical and emotional reactions you'll experience during the incident itself. Initially, when I heard a pattering feet and I looked up, you know, it's like your hair st stands up on the back of your neck. It's like, you know, you know what's going to happen. You see it coming and there's nothing you can do. Of course, my heart was, you know, just going for it. <laughs> uh, I felt like um, I was just a, 
how do you say, a bag of nerves on the inside. I can, you know, I can feel myself trembling, but you couldn't see it. You know, when I, I tried to walk calmly. Once I got to um, the safe haven, I, you could tell I was really, like, n you know, upset. My body obviously was, was pumping full of adrenaline. I had a hard time going to sleep that night and for several nights. At that particular moment when I found out that this individual was HIV positive, um, I was in a state of shock. Um, it's hard to describe that particular feeling. Um, I kind of became cold. Um, my hands became cold and kind of clampy, you know. Um, at the same time, I really couldn't express, uh, like I, I couldn't express what I was feeling. The only thing that I could do was like kind of like sternly tell her to lower her voice and I was upset with myself because when I did it, my finger was <laughs> shaking. And so called everybody together and we have different offices. So we had people from uh, an annex across the street said, get those people up here. Uh, call over to our Long Island offices, tell the supervisor out there, let him notify the staff. And I was so intent on it has to be personal, you know, that I didn't think about what I was going to say when I got a hundred people up in a room that they didn't fit in and everybody was kind of pouring out of the room. And I got up there and I, I looked around at, at all her friends and her coworkers and I shook. I mean, it took a tremendous amount. I just, my whole body kind of shook. To have a handgun pointed at you, not knowing what the person that's pointing at, at you intent is, and whether or not it's, it's loaded, you know, you don't know. And again, your life just flashed before your face, and all you, could do, you do is just hope and pray for the best. I just thought the worst case scenario, you know, worst case scenario, which was that, you know, I was infected and my life is going to change from this day on. You may also notice changes in your thinking about the world, your emotional life, and your behavior for days, weeks, or even months afterward. The first few nights, I had difficulty sleeping. Um, I'd wake up in a cold sweat. You're, you know, you're always almost literally looking over your shoulder waiting for this individual to do what he said he was going to do. And you're... Uh, especially initially, you're always concerned that one of your family members is going to be around you when this occurs. And uh, for a long time after that, you know, when I would walk the dog in the community or I'd be out cutting the grass or whatever, you know, when a strange car would slow down or someone would come up to you, you would always kind of tense up thinking, you know, is this it? For the first few weeks, whenever it got dark, even at home, you know, like it got dark and I forgot something outside and I had to go outside in an area that wasn't well lit, I became real paranoid, you know. I took my gun with me. I don't know, but when, you know, one question that popped up in my mind when, when this all happened was, uh, why me, you know? Here I am trying to help someone and, and uh, I end up um, having to go through a very difficult period. You, you feel mad, you think, you know, why me? I've done nothing wrong. You know, why, why should someone pick on me? And uh, yeah, you do feel like a victim. And there's, no, there's nothing you can do. You know, it's over, you can't, you can't back up. I couldn't go down that street for a while that the incident had happened on. I just, this, this happened in August of 92. I was just able to drive down that street uh, February of 92. I passed it a lot, but in, there were, uh, it's a, you can cross through that street to get to other areas or other addresses, and I wouldn't go down that street for a while. And um, I was apprehensive, even though she's incarcerated. I, you know, you still say, okay, well, she's told some people, you know, they might know my car. 
and so you're you you have to you know you I'm now more aware of that area because of what happened because you never know at the point of the incident and for a few weeks after that it was still so so uh, alive in me like the incident was very very present you know I um, you know, I could remember every single detail of, of uh, what took place, the individual in front of me, the, you know, the, the uh, um, you know, for a few days you can still see the, uh, the blood stains on, on the carpet until I came over and, uh, and um, uh, got rid of the stains. I wanted, I wanted to retaliate. You know, I honestly felt I could have took on those three guys if they were barehanded. That's how angry I was. I, you know, I was mad. And everything. I said, if they didn't have a gun, I think I could whoop all three of them. It was almost like, you know, f for a month or longer, we held our breaths. You know, it's like waiting for the other shoe to drop. You just, you just don't know when it's going to drop. And uh, I guess one of the jokes that we had at the time was, uh, don't get around Ron if a, if a truck backfires because. You know, <laughs> I would have probably uh, pulled out the weapon, you know. I'll but come back later. Okay. I'm sorry. It's important to recognize that these changes in reactions are occurring and that they're normal reactions so that you can deal with them effectively. People cope in different ways. Often what seems to help the most is just talking. But you have to decide what's right for you. I spoke with my wife a lot about it. Uh, I found that it helps. It helped me to talk to people about it. I just really called them just to hear their voice. You know, a kid has to hear the parents. And uh, I'm blessed enough to still have my parents, so I called them and just wanted to hear the, their voice and you know, just kind of let them know I had a rough day. The more people that I would tell this to, if I decided to do so, I would realize then that I would have to go step by step and um, again I would be living my anger, my, my shock, you know, my, my state of, of being in shock and um, I wanted to kind of put it aside because it's not a short story. The older FBI had had death threats in the past and so he shared with me his feelings and what his family had done, etc. So that part was good because it made me understand that, you know, you're not the only one that this has ever happened to. And obviously he's sitting there telling me these things, so it doesn't mean you're going to die. And so, you know, that helped. Even though, you know, I sh should have gotten tired, you know, telling the same story over and over again, I realized that that was therapy for me because I was speaking with people that I knew, whether it be family members, friends, officers. Ordinarily, by about six weeks after the incident, most of the more intrusive symptoms and reactions disappear, or at least become much less intense. Some effects may be with you for a long time, though, and that's normal, too. I guess it was really six months or so before we more or less start, started letting our guard down, and uh, uh, where I didn't wear a weapon constantly, and these sorts of things. Um, it's been approximately two and a half years. In all honesty, honestly, I, uh, I still don't uh, know that I'm totally uh, removed from that incident because I'm not as open and uh, outgoing as I normally would be. Sometimes I get, now, sometimes I get paranoid. If I walk out and it's real dark, or if I happen to be carrying my briefcase in one hand and my field book, then first I get real paranoid. I say, both hands are occupied. If somebody was to approach me, you know, how quick can I get rid of what I have in my hands? You know, or like if I'm in the field with my weapon and my hands, you know, how quick can I drop this stuff and get to my weapon if I need it? You know, before this person get toward me. So. No, that's something that still bothers me, and I think about that. I'm always thinking, how quick would I be able to react to an, you know, to an assailant that's rapidly approaching me? I pass by it almost 
pass by that station maybe 20 times a day. And uh, yeah, a few weeks ago, I was even the, the copy machine is right there, so I kind of turned around to see if I can see any stains. So yeah, it's still it's it's still um, when I pass that area, it's still livid, you know, in my in 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 my mind. The incident kind of like made you sit down and say, okay, this is a serious job. You know, this is something that you really, really have to be on your P's and Q's about because this is, you know, it can change just like that. Things can happen just like that. It was, had a great impact and probably more of an impact than the episode with Russell because when it's on your own uh, ground, you know, it, it's one thing when an something like this happens at the office and you're somewhat divorced from it, but when it impacts on your family and it's on your turf, it has a much greater impact. Things that I would usually take for granted, you know, I don't anymore. I mean, I look twice, three times to make sure, you know, that this is not a potential assailant. Uh, I mean, even even now, even now, it it this kind of thing makes you very much aware of the fragility of life, so that there is a sense of vulnerability. It changes your life. It makes you think more about your own mortality. Uh, it makes you more concerned about your relationship with your family and with others, and uh, it it changes kind of the way you uh, perceive things as far as long-term goals. Uh, you think more in terms of short-term goals. And uh, it's, there, it's been a change. Suppose one of your colleagues is the victim of a crime or experiences a critical incident. Of course, you'll want to be supportive. You'll want to listen when a fellow officer shares his or her feelings with you offer your assistance, and give the person room to work through some strong reactions to the incident. What you may not want to do, however, is realize that what affects your colleague may also have an effect on you and others in your office. They were stunned. But I looked around and just these somber, stunned uh, faces. Um, and then, and it was like, what can I do? Everybody's reaction was, what can I do? Um, and there wasn't just a lot. We had a lot to do, and we did do quite a bit as, as the days continued. Um, but there wasn't enough for 100 people to do. People had um, nightmares. I mean, I had a couple of different stories of, of very odd and sort of nightmarish dreams. Uh, from different people, um, difficulty thinking about anything else. Um, some people focusing on the incident and specifically, like the moment of her death and what happened at the moment of her death. Um, all different kinds of of Thing. Some people feeling just very vulnerable and talking about safety issues. Um, people talking about going out and buying uh, better gun lockers for their home. You know, gee, I have a kid, and I, you know, this boy that's made me just aware of how much responsibility that that gun is. And I have a gun, like, you know, place where I lock it up. But you know, I was thinking maybe I should look at a better, stronger, <laughs> tougher less penetratable gun locker. Um, it's run the gamut in terms of the way that people have reacted. Um, what becomes clear is that when one officer is a victim, others in the office, fellow officers, supervisors, and administrators, will be affected too. For a period of about five weeks, different probation officers from the field Officers came and they were armed and they stayed in the office with me uh, throughout the day. And if we went out, primarily uh, I did not go out during this time to make field visits. 
uh, which was the first time ever that that had happened. But uh, my chief's feeling is that I was more vulnerable out making home visits than I was in the office. Everybody had different suggestions so that somebody would call up and say, Elaine, what we, what we need is we need black bands to go cover our badges so that as a sign of respect. Somebody took care of that. Um, we need to, you know, take care of the plaque. Someone did that. We need, there were just so many different things to do. The officers in the department were very, very uh, supportive. Not only my friends, that are, um, everyone builds friendships in their office place, but the officers that I didn't know as well as others um, came up to me and, and, and showed their uh, concern and, and supportiveness, you know, of me and, and that. No, that was good. It made fe people feel better when they were able to contribute to that effort. So that, and that had to be done, I mean, it, it would have been too easy to just take over and do everything, and that would be unfair to the people. And one of her good friends, um, we made sure that he had an opportunity to write um, the, mem the memoriam, uh, a memorandum, I guess, for the uh, news and views and to go out in our office. Um, you know, that was a, a good thing to do. He was a good friend of hers and needed something uh, to help him focus so that he could do something for her. Um, and so everybody kind of did something in the office, and everybody wanted to do something. So there was Just as individual officers must take steps to cope with their responses to victimization, so must organizations. Chiefs and supervisors should take prompt, active steps to counteract the potential effects of a critical incident. Of course, there's no formula for the right response in any given situation, but it's always better to do something than nothing. Um, upon hearing of the incident, um, my, again, my immediate supervisor just um, um, brought me to uh, his office and, and, and let me speak and, and he, he was concerned. You know, he was concerned about my well-being at that point, um, not only with the incident but how I was um, reacting, you know, the fact that I really wasn't reacting. Even my supervisor, which I was even on guard, you know, as, as to what that reaction would be, was very compassionate and very understanding and extremely outraged, very supportive. So that, that helped a lot. There was an issue of when and how to reassign her work. I mean, it's a simple, a simple thing, but it, it became an issue because it was, okay, well, we don't want to give it to this person because this person's too good a friend, so we'll assign it to this person because maybe it'll be easier for them to do it because they're not. And then her friends say, why didn't you give it to me? Um, I want to do it. It's something I could do for her. Why are you giving it to this person who doesn't even know her? And it's like, oh, well, you know, here you think you're doing the right thing. Here you're trying, look, you know, do this and, you know, let's reassign it to this person rather than this person to try and be sensitive to their needs. And you, you, so, um, so, yeah, there's, they, there's just so many things that, to, that come up. The next day, because I wasn't able to get it, uh, my supervisor called me. The chief called, the deputy chief. So I started getting phone calls, you know, from co-workers. So I felt good about that because here it is, you know. I, at least I know my co-workers, you know, were concerned. The following day, when I started work, my immediate supervisor came in with my chief, and they both sat down and kind of spent a uh, um, good portion of, of the uh, morning with me. and. Um, express their concerns. Uh, and you just try your best and try and figure out. And, but the best thing is to do is just be straightforward and honest about it. Like, listen, hey guys, we don't know what to do either. We're all kind of struggling together and let's, let's try and do this together. Let's try and work it out together. Uh, at one point when I was uh, doing the notification uh, to the staff, uh, so I said, what can we do? It's like, take care of one another. You know, be good to one another. Uh, that's what you can do right now is support one another. Yeah, that's what you can do. Uh, so, 
but yeah, I don't think that there's any, any manual that will tell you exactly what to do or how to do it correctly in this kind of a situation. Uh, because each one of them is different. Each kind of critical incident situation is different. At this point, you may be thinking, all right then, if I'm a victim, I'll admit it and deal with it. But that won't take me very long. I'll get myself out of victim status and back on track in no time. But consider a phrase that's been used in other contexts. The only way out is through. I think basically what happened, though, by continuously playing the event over and over in my mind and each time realizing that if you wanted to live, there is... There was nothing else you could have done. Now, if you didn't care about yourself or your family, if you wanted to die, then you could have done basically whatever you wanted to and be, you know, and be a dead hero. You just you go through it um, just thinking about what happened, and you do think about, OK, well, what if she did hit you? You know, um, what if she you know, came at you when she ran out the house? Or you do kind of, you try to go over and say, well, could I have handled this differently? Could I have, um, you know, because you, something like that, when you don't expect it, or when you, you didn't see it coming or whatever, you try to, you always, I think it's human nature to try to, could I have done this differently? Could I have said this differently? Could I have reacted differently? And I even thought, at some point of blaming myself. Well, you know, why do you have to jump in? You know, what caused you to you know, jump in and, 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 uh, and help this individual? You know, and that's what I, after analyzing that, real, I realized that that's not, I don't, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be the person to blame, you know? Um, and also realized that if the situation happened again, I would um, continue, you know, hope to react um, to help the individual or you know, whatever the case may be. So you talk it through and you think it through so much that you kind of are able to put it aside. Um, and you feel comfortable putting it aside because you've looked at it every way you can look at it. You know, up, down, you know, sideways, you've talked about it, you've remembered. Um, and you kind of just put it aside. Once you've become a victim, there's no easy way out. The best and fastest way out is to go through the process these officers have discussed. Admit to yourself that you've been victimized, recognize what your reactions have been, and take whatever steps you need to cope with those reactions. Involve your colleagues and your supervisors and seek professional help if you need it. And be open to positive changes that can come out of the negative experience. Remember, the only way out is through. Now I, I feel as though I handled it the best way I possible could. At this point, there is no blame. In my mind, I just uh, reacted and this situation occurred and uh, just kind of go forward. I can't say with confidence, oh yeah, I can get through everything, but it does make you feel really good about yourself when you do handle something like this calmly with a, a good head on your shoulders and you're able to assess the situation clearly and you survive it. It makes you feel really good.